What am I playing? Super Mario Brothers series. Damn it. Super Mario Brothers, to many, is the first real video game. This of course isn't true, obviously, but for many, myself included, the original Super Mario Bros was their first real experience with home gaming consoles, to say nothing of the way it revolutionized the industry. Scrolling, continuous levels, and ending distinct levels and enemies, graphics that at the time were a bit more detailed than what you would expect to see for a video game, especially a home video game system and pretty damn catchy music. Super Mario Bros. helped to make all of this standard for home console gaming. Sure, that stuff did exist sparsely in games before, but rarely all in one package. But you already knew all that, didn't you? Super Mario Bros. and its sequels have been talked about, dissected, analyzed, reinterpreted, homaged, and documented to death now. Heck, it's still being picked apart, and every now and then you still hear about people finding new glitches, new exploits, and new quirks in this game. It's fascinating. So really, with all the documentation and information and opinions swarming around this series, is there really any point to me adding my voice to an already overcrowded choir? Yes, yes there is, because I like talking about things I love. I might not be adding anything new to the conversation, but damn it, I have opinions and I'm gonna share them. Also because I guess I'm now making longer videos exclusively, we'll also take a look at the other games in the original Mario Quadrilogy. And Mario All-Stars too, because why not? So let's start off with talking about the original Super Mario Bros, originally released on the NES three separate times. Yeah, you all remember these guys? Super Mario Bros. wasn't only released as a standalone cartridge, but it ended up bundled with various Nintendo system sets, put on a cartridge with games meant to show off various accessories Nintendo was shilling at the time, such as Duck Hunt for the Nintendo Zapper, and World Class Track Meet for the Nintendo Power Pad. But we aren't touching either of those games today, we're gonna be taking a look at Mario and only Mario, and occasionally Luigi, and very infrequently Toad and Princess Peach too, or Toadstool as she was known back then. The story of Mario Bros is the quintessential Mario story, the formula that would be repeated ad nauseum for the rest of time. Though, as the first in the series, it does give a small explanation as to how the plumbers slash former carpenters from Brooklyn ended up in a magical world of sentient mushrooms and talking turtles. They fell down a pipe and got shot out into the Mushroom Kingdom, a magical land currently under the sway of the evil Bowser, leader of the Koopa Clan, who practiced black magic, and has used that magic to turn all of the denizens in the land into stone blocks, and has imprisoned Princess Toadstool, the only one who can actually stop his reign of terror. Yeah, in the original backstory, he's not kidnapping Toadstool because he wants to marry her, just because she is the only one who can break his spell. The whole forced marriage angle wouldn't really show up in the games until the third in the series, uh, technically fourth, but we'll get to that when we get to it. It's an NES game, so you can't really expect any deep storytelling from it, and besides, the story's never really been much of a focus for Mario, even in his later games. Heck, even in the RPGs, while having a lot more of it, have always kept their plots more on the simple side. But anyway, you play as Mario, the jumping plumber, in what is the template for pretty much every platformer that would come afterwards. You run from left to right, hold down the B button to go fast, and jump over or on enemies and obstacles that stand in your way to reach the goal at the end of the level. There are eight worlds in total, with four levels in each world, and the last level is always a castle. Most of the other levels are platformers on solid ground, but you do get some variation in the form of levels like platforming across giant trees and mushrooms, swimming through an ocean, traversing an underground passage, or trying to run across a giant bridge while angry fish launch themselves at you continuously. These were always my least favorite stages in the original, mostly because the fish behavior was just random enough that I always ended up getting clipped by a fish that was leaping out in front of me. Now, you can deal with most of these threats just by jumping on them. Basic Goombas are completely gone after one stomp, but anything wearing a shell, like Koopas and Buzzy Beetles, well, you stomp on them and they just retract into their shells. 
There are plenty of enemies you can't jump on as well, like the vicious spinies dropped by Lakitu up in the air, or the piranha plants that move in and out of the various green pipes dotting the landscape. But have no fear because there are some power-ups that can help you combat these threats more effectively. First, there's the Super Mushroom. This'll turn Mario big, which basically just equates to having an extra hit point if he runs into an enemy or obstacle. Beyond that, the biggest change is that Mario gets the ability to duck, since he's now twice as large as he was before. In some ways, you could consider that a downgrade, as it means that Mario can now be struck by threats he could just run under before, but that's a pretty small downside considering the extra hit you get out of it. Then there's the Fire Flower, which allows you to shoot fireballs with a tap of the B button, up to two at a time, which will hop merrily along until they either reach the end of the screen, hit an enemy, or hit a wall. They're capable of taking out most enemies that you can't jump on, like the aforementioned piranha plants or spinies, and enough of them can even take out the Bowser clones located at the end of the castle levels, revealing that most of the Bowsers are in fact fakes meant to mislead you. You can even throw the fireballs underwater, which is basically your only way of defending yourself in the couple of ocean levels found in the game, since you can't actually jump while swimming through the water, and these levels just happen to host bloopers, squid enemies that move in an incredibly annoying zigzag pattern that will change depending on whether Mario is above or below them, and which direction he's facing at the time. However, there are still a few enemies that can't be harmed with fire at all, such as the Buzzy Beetles or Bullet Bills, but they can still be incapacitated or defeated by jumping on them in some form or fashion. However, if you take damage while carrying a Fire Flower, not only do you lose it, but also the effects of the Super Mushroom as well, since you already have to be Super Mario to have the Fire Flower appear. This gives you even more of an incentive to keep from getting hit, since even Bowser at the end of the castles can be defeated by hitting him with five fireballs. And the other power-up is the Invincibility Star. It's rare and often hidden amongst groups of ordinary innocuous blocks that were most likely at some point innocent citizens of the kingdom, making you a horrible, awful, murderous monster if that really is the case. The star, as its name suggests, gives you a good 10 or so seconds of complete invincibility to enemies, allowing you to defeat them with a touch, but you can still die via dropping into a bottomless pit or falling into lava or the like, so you still need to be aware of your surroundings. And that's about it for power-ups. It's a small spread, but it certainly does what it needs to, which is to help keep you alive as long as possible. You'll need the help too, because the difficulty of the game ramps up, uh, but in the best way possible. Over the course of the eight worlds, Super Mario Bros. does a fantastic job of slowly increasing the difficulty and challenging you as you move along. New members of its short enemy list are introduced slowly, with the more dangerous ones like Lakitu and Hammer Brothers used sparingly for the most part, so it's always tense when they show up. And when they become much more common come the last couple of worlds, you feel more comfortable dealing with them, but still tense and wary when they appear, especially when Hammer Brothers start showing up on the ground. Let's not kid ourselves, the Hammer Brother at the very end of the final castle before you reach Bowser, that's the real final boss of the game, and God help you if you don't have at least a super mushroom on you when you reach that point. Oh yeah, the castle stages, there's something to talk about, but let's back up for a second and talk about the stages as a whole. Most of them are fairly short, short enough that, for the most part, you probably won't notice the timer in the upper right corner, which will give you a warning chime if you start to run out of time, but the only time I ever came close to running out of time, even when I was playing as a kid, was in the last world, where all three levels leading up to the final castle are much longer in comparison to the other levels throughout the game. Well, there was one other time, but I'll get into that soon. Apart from the basic ground-based platform levels, there are several other level themes that change up the feel or mechanics of the game, if only slightly. There's the underground levels, which are basically just like regular overworld levels, but with a different color scheme, and generally have a few tighter spaces to navigate through. Then there are the sky levels, where you're hopping across the top of large trees or mushrooms. These are more of a challenge for your platforming skills, with much less solid ground to stand on. Underwater levels are the worst in my opinion. They generally have no power-ups, and if you don't go in already possessing a fire flower, you are totally helpless in the water. 
You can't jump underwater, so you can't stomp on enemies, and you have to deal with schools of Cheap Cheeps and Bloopers, one of the more frustrating enemies due to their unusual zigzag pattern like I mentioned before. Not to mention, the swimming controls are not the best, it can be very difficult to get a handle on. A close second for worst levels comes from the bridge levels, again mentioned earlier. There are only two of these in the game, but man are they annoying. You're going across a long suspension bridge, connecting the beginning and end of the level, dealing with fish jumping up from below you the entire way across because of the semi-random nature of where the fish will leap from and how their in-air arc works. And then there are the castle levels, which are quite sinister. There are generally less enemies in these levels than regular ones, and most of the time they're actually shorter than regular levels, but to make up for this, they throw in a huge amount of obstacles, like jumping fireballs, rotating fireballs, fiery lava pits, scrolling fire shots spat out by Bowser himself. There's a lot of fire in these places. Bowser himself is actually not that threatening of a boss at the end of these places. He can spit fire and can't be stomped on due to his spiked shell, but five fireballs is enough to take him down. And if you don't have fire, you can just run under him when he jumps and grab the battle axe behind him, which will sever the bridge and drop him into the magma below. Doing it that way won't get you any points, but hey, a win is a win, and who really cares about points anymore? I do like the fact that the first seven Bowsers you fight are actually fakes, and it's actually kind of fun if you manage to get there with a fireball and blast them with enough of them to make them drop their disguises, as then you find out that it was basically just an ordinary mook impersonating him, from a Goomba to a Koopa up to a Hammer Brother. Speaking of hammers, Bowser does eventually start throwing them himself, but there's actually far less threat to his hammers than the basic Hammer Brother enemies you encounter throughout the game. The brothers' hammers are thrown in a specific pattern, but there's enough space and variance between the hammers that getting past them without good timing can be very tricky, especially if you're on the same level as them. Bowser, by contrast, lets a giant stream of hammers fly and then leaves a large gap open, allowing you to slide under his arcs pretty easily, with the only danger being if he decides to spit a fireball while you're between him and his hammers. The castles for most of the game are fine, but the last few castles introduce probably the worst gimmick in the game. You remember when I mentioned there was one other instance where I was close to running out of time most of the time? This is it. These castles are mazes, and not traditional mazes either. Instead, you're required to run through the stage down either a high, low, or middle pathway. And if you go through these paths in the wrong order, then the section will loop and you'll have to try again until you get the right combination to move on. Generally, the maze castles have two sections like this, one right after the other. And if you don't already know the combination, then you can waste a lot of time in this place. You don't even get any indication as to whether you've gone through the right or wrong path. The level just loops again and you have to take another guess. Still, better than the two water levels in this game, which is technically only one water level. Yeah, when you play through this game a few times, you'll also take note that a few of the levels are repeated. Like the exact same layout, just with more obstacles or enemies thrown in. The water level, the bridge level, a handful of the castles all follow this idea. Heck, in the earlier castles, you can even tell where new obstacles are going to be added with these blank boxes that act as anchors for the fireballs. And let me be clear, repeating a stage like this isn't really a bad thing. The game allegedly took up a lot of cartridge memory, to the point where the Goomba, the last enemy actually added to the game, essentially only had one walking sprite, just mirrored back and forth, just so that they would have the space to add them into the game. So, reusing the level design is perfectly fine, and while the layout is the same, the added enemies and obstacles do spice up the design enough that it feels like a different experience. Of course, you'll probably be running and jumping through the levels a bit too quickly to really take in the similarities of the design. The controls in this game are simple. You move left to right, you can jump, and you can run. Holding down the run button lets you run indefinitely, and tapping it, if you have a fire flower, lets you shoot fireballs, up to two at a time. And the control is... fine? I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Mario controls perfectly fine, but I do feel like I've been spoiled by just how good 2D Mario feels in even the games that came out right after this one. 
Mario's jump is pretty high and has a nice arc to it, but you don't have a huge amount of control over him when he's in the air. And if you don't have a lot of momentum running forward, you actually don't get a huge amount of distance. I mean, what you get is perfectly fine, but man, you can cover some really good distance when you jump after a run. You can also do shorter hops by tapping the jump button, which allows you to make more precise jumps, but Mario does still carry a rather large amount of momentum when he's moving, which means that he takes a little time to stop after you take your hand off the D-pad, and that can make turning around a little bit difficult. But I do want to make it clear, the game controls fine. The speed at which you can move, the jump height, it all feels good and right, and the momentum, while it can make precise platforming a bit more terrifying than it should, does still feel pretty appropriate for the game. It's especially nice just how responsive everything feels, especially jumping and shooting fireballs. The music and graphics are all just classic. There are a few scant tunes in the game, but what music there is is quintessential video game music. The overworld theme, the water theme, the underground theme, and the castle theme all make up the bulk of the game's soundtrack, and they all sound great even today even if the blippy, chippy NES sound chip does make some of them a little grating to listen to for extended periods, specifically the castle theme. And then there are the stingers that play for things like finishing a level, dying, or getting a game over. The graphics, though, I've kind of soured on them as time has gone on. Again, first in the series, very early video game for its time, revolutionized this sort of game, etc. I just don't find them that interesting. The limited color palette, the way that the enemies in Mario look, I'm just not into it. Especially with just how much nicer future games look. Even ignoring the games that came out afterwards though, visually the game is fine, again, but it doesn't resonate with me the way that it used to. It's classic, yes. But it being classic doesn't make it phenomenal, in my opinion. It's also worth noting that this is one of the very first games to possess something resembling a New Game Plus mode. If you beat the game, you can press start to immediately restart the game on a bit of a harder difficulty level. Not a lot changes, honestly. Ground-based enemies move much faster, and all of the Goombas in the game are replaced with Buzzy Beetles, which makes the Fire Flower a lot less useful. But so long as it can still kill Hammer Brothers, it still has plenty of application and utility. Oh, and of course there are the secret warp zones you can find scattered around, usually located beyond the ending pipe in an underground level, which can be used to skip over huge chunks of the game if you know where to find the right ones. The game is a classic and it still plays well. Its age does show in some areas, like the fact that it still uses lives in the game over system, which was indicative of video games at the time, but I do think it's still fun to play. I don't play it nearly as often as other games in the series though. Still, even with how much better the other games are compared to the first, the first game still holds a lot of fun and charm if you haven't been playing the game over and over since childhood. Even a bit of a good challenge here and there, too. But I sure can't say that about its direct sequel! Super Mario Bros. 2, released in Japan, and only in Japan a year after the original, was viewed by Nintendo not really as a proper sequel, but as an expansion or a continuation of the original game. In fact, it was pitched as Super Mario for Super Players, a game meant for anyone who had already mastered the original. And to that end, it basically shut out anyone who had never played the original before or didn't enjoy massive leaps in difficulty. We in America didn't get this game, mostly because Nintendo viewed it as too hard for Western audiences. What we did get, we'll talk about in a bit, but for now let's focus on the fact that Nintendo was probably right. I mean, making an assumption about an entire section of the world seems like a bad business decision, but I've been playing this game off and on for years, mostly the updated re-release that was part of the All-Stars collection, and I still hate it. To be fair, this was the first real sequel to Nintendo's flagship franchise, but even barring that excuse, Super Mario Bros. 2, which I will now refer to exclusively by its American title of Lost Levels, feels like an antithesis to the design philosophies that would define Nintendo's style of game design later on. It doesn't feel very fair or intuitive, the design of many of the levels and obstacles is outright meant to be frustrating, trial and error is basically a necessity, the game as a whole just doesn't feel as fun to play to me as other Mario games. 
It's not because it's hard. A game can be hard and still be fun and fair with its challenge, but I maintain that Lost Levels is hard because it is just not fair. Most things in this game are lifted from the first, including enemies, and most obstacles and power-ups, and the music is pretty similar as well, though some of the graphics and the music did get a touch-up considering this was released on the Famicom Disk System, an add-on for the original Famicom that allowed games to be placed on floppy disks rather than cartridge. The game does benefit from that in a few ways, but it's also hampered by it in others. We'll get into it. First off, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about stuff like controls, graphics, story, and music. The story is quite literally a carbon copy of the first game, with Bowser returning to threaten the Mushroom Kingdom again, and kidnapping Princess Toadstool a second time. The controls are identical to the first game, including Mario's momentum and how he functions. The graphic and sounds, like I said, mostly took everything from the first game, but gave them slight touch-ups here and there. Like, look at the ground graphics now, that's a much more impressive texture. And there's some more detail in the background elements as well. The added memory of the disk system also allows for more to be displayed on screen at once without having to worry about slowdown or sprite flickering, which is nice, but it also means you'll be dealing with a lot more at once, too. And more than once, I did run into situations where things just wouldn't load in properly like enemies would appear out of nowhere or reappear after I had died in places that they weren't before. The major difference between this game and the first is, obviously, its difficulty. The game was designed to be challenging, extremely so, and no, before you say anything, it isn't Kaizo level of frustrating, but this sure does feel like a template for what Kaizo hacks would become down the line. It throws enemies at you that you wouldn't necessarily expect or see coming. It expects you to use absolute precision and know exactly how far or high Mario can jump and when to jump to clear certain gaps and obstacles. It expects you to look for hidden blocks all over the place in order to even progress. And most annoyingly, it requires you to use some tricky techniques based on the game's mechanics that didn't often come up in the original game, if they ever did at all. I think one of the best known instances of this is probably the infamous triangle jump, where in order to beat a stage that is constantly looping, you have to perfectly time a drop jump onto a paratroopa to hit a question block that contains a vine leading up to the proper ending of the stage, while also making sure you don't travel forward too far after landing the jump, or risk losing sight of the vine and being unable to go back to it. The game even punishes you for trying to utilize tricks that the original game taught and encouraged. Remember how awesome it was to find warp zones in the first game? Well, in this game, getting to them is much harder, and if you aren't careful, you might run into situations like this, where in an exciting moment of discovery, you can end up jumping over the flagpole at the end of a level and end up finding a warp zone that will take you backwards a few worlds. The devs knew that this was a particularly mean trick too, so the game does actually give you a way to just lose a life rather than go back to the beginning of the game. That is, if you still have lives left to lose. Thankfully, the game doesn't boot you all the way back to the start if you lose all your lives, instead starting you on the first level of the world you were at when you lost your last life. You could do this in the original game too, via a button input code, but here it's just given to you as a natural part of the game, which is nice. It means you have unlimited continues, but you're still unfortunately stuck in a pretty bad situation. If you get all the way to the castle of a world and then lose all your lives, it is particularly devastating to have to replay that entire world again just to get another shot at the castle. What's more, despite this being on the disk system, there is no save feature. So while you can continue as much as you want, you can't stop playing before you beat the game, or you have to start all over. Even the new stuff that was added to this game feels like it was designed to make the game harder or more annoying. They introduce a new mushroom into this game, the Poison Mushroom, which looks similar to the Super Mushroom, but grabbing this one will result in taking damage or killing Mario if he doesn't already have a power-up. And these things always seem to pop up in the worst places. In fact, one of the first question blocks in the game, one you run into right after finding the first Super Shroom, is a poison one. Which is about as nice as the game gets in terms of teaching you about its new design philosophies. There's a bunch of new worlds beyond the 8th world, but they sure as heck don't get any easier. 
In fact, the ninth world is more of an homage to an infinite looping glitch in the first game. And you only get one life while you're there, and in order to access worlds A through D, you have to be level 8-4 a bunch of times to even access worlds that are harder than the main game. So no thank you! And then there's the addition of a Luigi game in the main menu, rather than having the two-player option that the first game had. It was that sort of take turns multiplayer, where one player plays until they die and then it switches over to the other player and so forth. In this game, you can instead choose to play as Luigi for the entire game rather than Mario. He was just a simple second player palette swap in the first game, but here, this is the first instance of Luigi being given the elements that would become staples of his character going forward in future games where he wasn't just a swap of Mario. He can jump much higher and further than Mario, with a floatier jump and everything, but his traction on the ground is next to nothing, meaning making precise long jumps is almost impossible with him. The extra jump height is not worth the headaches of dealing with him sliding all over the place. A lot of folks do still regard this game as a classic, and I won't argue that its existence is important, as many of the elements introduced here would crop up in later games in the series and be utilized in much better ways. However, as a game itself, while there's nothing inherently wrong with it, no major game-breaking glitches and such, the game itself runs fine, maybe even better than the original, that doesn't mean the overall design of the game is any fun. A game can be challenging and still be fun, as I've said before, but I maintain that The Lost Levels is an example of a game that is not fun, and it always actively feels like it's working against the player to make them miserable. And that's honestly not a feeling I'm used to getting from Mario games, let alone Nintendo games in general. So let's talk about the better sequel to Super Mario Bros. I think it's a pretty well-known factoid at this point, but the American Mario Bros. 2 did not originally start as a Mario game. Instead, it was originally an abandoned prototype that was eventually utilized for a licensed game called Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic using mascots for a Fuji TV festival special. Now, since Nintendo probably wouldn't be able to re-release the original game anyway, given its status as a licensed game, they reskinned it as a Mario game and released it in the West rather than the Lost Levels. I think we got the better end of that bargain by a wide margin. However, Nintendo did eventually release our version of Mario 2 in Japan, just calling it Super Mario USA. Since the original game was released on the disc system and utilized the added memory to implement a save game system, I do have to wonder how the Japanese audience felt about the fact that they were essentially being sold a game they'd already gotten, just reskinned with different characters and without the save functionality. As is often the case with many early video game sequels, Super Mario 2 is very different from the game that came before. Well, obviously in this case, considering it's literally a different game. And yet, I honestly think this game manages to fit squarely into the Mario series without much hassle, though that might have just been an opinion formed out of hindsight. This game was looked at as quite the black sheep back in the day. The story this time follows Mario, Luigi, Toadstool, and Toad, all having a shared dream about a land called Subcon, the land of dreams. The denizens of this world are currently under the thrall of a terrifying being known as Wart, who is taking control of the Dream Machine, a machine that produces sweet dreams for everyone in the world, and has converted it into a nightmare production factory. Mario and friends now need to travel together through this strange new world to find and stop Wart before Subcon, and dreams in general, become nothing but nightmares. That's a pretty good hook for an adventure, I think. Unfortunately, it's only told to us via text blurb at the start of the game, if you wait on the main screen for a bit. I might not mind so much if the original game, Doki Doki Panic, didn't get an intro cutscene of its own, showing off exactly how the plot gets started. Ah well, cartridge limitations and the like. So in order to stop Wart, our four heroes need to traverse across seven different worlds, each containing three levels, save for the last world, which only has two. This means that the game has a total of 20 stages, but don't let that fool you into thinking the game is going to be shorter than the original. The stages are significantly longer than the first games, some of the later ones feeling like outright marathons. It's easy to understand why the save feature in the original game would have been handy to have here, though I do still think this is a pretty comfortable length for an NES game. 
The game is straight up platformer, with the goal being to get to the end of each level. Almost every level culminates in a miniature boss fight against a character named Birdo, famously video game's first trans character. She's easy enough to deal with whenever she shows up, but the final level of each world does feature a boss fight against a tougher enemy, though the game weirdly recycles the bosses quite a bit. You fight this triple-headed snake Triclide twice, and this guy Mouser three times. While they do get faster in later encounters, the strategy remains pretty much the same every time you fight them. The other bosses at least try to change things up a little bit more, but none of them are very challenging. The challenge in the game comes from platforming your way past all the various enemies and obstacles placed in your way. You have the general run and jump mechanics from the original Super Mario, but in this game, enemies aren't defeated by stomping on them. Instead, when you jump on top of them, you can ride on top of them which is necessary in certain situations, but your primary way of dealing with enemies is to pick up and throw them. Generally, throwing an enemy isn't enough to defeat them, as they'll just get right back up again. Instead, you have to throw enemies into each other, pick up and throw back their projectiles, or pluck vegetables from the ground and toss them at enemies in order to clear the way. And it's pretty impressive how many different objects and enemies you can pick up and throw in this game. Almost anything that doesn't cause damage on impact or that you can safely stand on top of, can be picked up and thrown. And as an added wrinkle of strategy, you'll also have to decide who is going to be doing that throwing, because you have multiple characters to choose from for this adventure. At the start of every level, you can choose between Mario, Luigi, Toadstool, and Toad to play through the level as, and this isn't just an aesthetic choice either. Each character plays quite different from the others while retaining the same core moveset. Mario is the basic average guy, perfectly average in every category. His jump height is good but not great, and the speed with which he can pick up and throw objects is also good but not great. He's a good choice for a character in order to get a decent idea of how the game feels. Luigi jumps super high and also has a floatier jump, but while his traction isn't as bad as in the lost levels, his floaty high jump is pretty difficult to control, and because he jumps so high, even with a short hop, it can make precise platforming, or even something as simple as landing on the eggs that Birdo fires at you, a little bit difficult. He also has the second lowest strength of the four characters, meaning it takes him longer to pull something up into his arms, meaning he'll be vulnerable for longer while doing so. Gotta be honest, of the four, Luigi is my least favorite to play as, as while the higher jump height is great for longer, vertical scrolling levels, I generally don't think it's worth the frustration of trying to land on enemies or obstacles. Princess Toadstool, however, she's fantastic. While her jump height is on par with Mario, she has the ability to hover in the air for a few seconds, letting her clear huge amounts of distance in a single bound, making her great for getting over difficult terrain or enemy-infested areas. The big trade-off for that, though, is that she is by far the weakest of the characters, and it takes her significantly longer to pick up anything she tries to lift, which can be particularly dangerous in boss or mid-boss battles. But honestly, that's the only real drawback to using Peach, her hover ability is the perfect amount of helpful without feeling too overpowered, and it is easy to get overconfident and overuse it, which can lead to you accidentally dropping into a pit if you aren't paying attention. And finally, there's Toad. He has the shortest natural jump of the four characters, leading to him being unable to make some jumps without assistance, either using enemies or mushroom platforms, or by using the new super jump ability. Oh yeah, forgot to mention that. Everyone has access to a super jump that can be activated by just staying in place and ducking down for a few seconds, which allows you to jump extra high. On Luigi, my god, you can use that to make some extreme jumps. On Toad, though, it's used to basically clear stuff the other characters could easily reach with their normal jumps. But, as you probably discerned, the trade-off for his poor jumping ability is that he is also the strongest of all four characters, able to speedily pick up and toss enemies. Ironically, while his short jump might seem like a big detriment, and it can be at times, it's not nearly as bad as you would think. A big part of the challenge of the game is trying to choose characters that are appropriate for situations in each level, or at least it would be if it weren't for the fact that choosing either Peach or Toad was probably the best choice you could make. Sure, Mario can get through any level without much issue, but Toad and Peach both trivialize a lot of the challenge for dealing with platforming or enemies, respectively. And Luigi? 
Well, he helps with the vertical levels here and there, but it's so easy to lose control over him. It also really doesn't help that once you choose a character, you're stuck with that character until you either run out of lives or complete the stage. So on the off chance you find yourself in a stage with a character that really just isn't gelling with you, you can feel a bit stuck. Though the way the game's levels are designed, I really don't think that's too big of an issue. If you do run out of lives, the game does run on a continue system. You have three continues total, and while you can earn more lives throughout the game, either by finding them hidden throughout the levels or in the after-level bonus game, you can't get more continues, and if those run out, then it's game over and it's back to the start for you. The way this game works mechanically is also a little bit different from typical Mario Fair. We've already discussed picking up and throwing stuff as the central mechanic, but there's also the fact that the HUD itself is really minimalist. You have no score, no life counter, no nothing on screen while you're playing. All you get is your health bar, which, when you start a level, is always two hits. It's nice to start with an extra hit, as opposed to starting small like in the other games, but with how easy it is to take damage here, two hits might not get you too far, especially later in the game. The good news is, you can extend your life meter. The bad news is... well, there's a lot of bad news when it comes to this. For starters, even when your health bar is extended to a maximum of four hearts, you will immediately go back down to two hearts after completing a level, meaning you have to find health increases in every level or just go through the level with only a couple of hits. And then there's how you find the things. Occasionally, you'll find a potion bottle hidden under the ground, when pulling roots up out of the ground. When you throw the potion onto the ground, a red door materializes in its place. If you go through the door, you'll end up in a negative zone referred to as subspace, and if you place the door in the proper place, you might come across a super mushroom. And by picking that up, you'll gain an extra hit point. But again, the door needs to be placed in a specific area for the mushroom to appear. And generally, where the mushroom is located will be further from where you found the potion the further into the game you get. Or maybe require you to first alter the real world before you can reach it in subspace. Beyond that though, you won't get very many power-ups. Apart from the health-extending mushroom, you can collect cherries around each level, and if you grab five of them, then an invincibility star will float up from the bottom of the screen. But that's a bit of a pain because it can easily float inside of a wall or a place where you can't reach, and the star doesn't last very long in this game, and depending on where you get it, it can be somewhat useless if there aren't a lot of enemies around. You can also get a heart that will restore one point of health, but you can only get hearts if you defeat a certain number of enemies by hitting them with each other or vegetables. And again, it floats up from the bottom of the screen, and you can easily lose track of it if you don't grab it right away. There's also this weird time stopper that you can sometimes pull up from the ground, but I generally didn't find much use in it. It freezes all enemies and platforms in their tracks, but that can actually be a bit of a hindrance depending on where you find it. But the other big thing about subspace is that any roots you pull up while in there will turn into coins. What good are they, you ask, when the game doesn't even tell you how many you've collected? Well, when you complete a level, you're taken to a slot machine bonus game. Every coin you've collected gives you one spin on the machine, and if you manage to get a good combination, you'll earn lives, up to five at a time, believe it or not. Apart from the very rare scattered one-up mushrooms you can find in the stages themselves, this is basically how you're going to earn most of your extra lives. And there are always areas in each level that are full of roots, so dropping the potion there to grab a bunch of extra coins is always a good idea. Subspace is also how you access the warp zones in this game. In specific levels, if you bring a potion to a warp pipe and enter subspace and then drop down into the pipe, it'll instantly warp you to a later level in the game. I actually really like this setup, as it makes the warp zones much harder to find than just rushing to the end of a level and going over the end pipe to find the warps that you were looking for. Not that that's a bad way of handling it, but this encourages you to experiment and explore a little bit, and getting to some of the later warp zones in the game can actually be a bit of a challenge. In terms of the graphics of the game, oh my god, we have ourselves some color. It's no real contest, the game looks so much nicer than the original, and the original didn't look bad per se, but its limited graphics and color palette could get tiring on the eyes after playing it for a while. Mario 2, on the other hand, has a much wider range of colors and locales to it. It looks fantastic, 
with all of the levels looking particularly varied from one another, and a few of the worlds even having their own distinct themes, such as World 4's Ice and Snow, and World 7's Castle in the Sky aesthetic. There's more of its fair share of desert levels in the game, though, with pyramids in the background and lots of sandy tombs and caves to explore, though that was mostly left over from Doki Doki Panic, which did have a very obvious Arabian Nights theme. This game also introduces us to a rather varied number of enemies as well, despite having fewer levels than the past two games. However, pretty much all of them are dealt with in the same sort of way. You either pick them up and throw them into each other or off a cliff, and if you can't pick them up, then you just throw something at them. I suppose that's not too different from either jumping on an enemy or hitting them with fireballs, as they do have some pretty varied attacks and uses. These big red birds named Albatosses are used as platforms to get across wide gaps in several levels. This flightless bird named Pidget needs to be thrown off his flying carpet so you can use it for your own. Heck, there's even a stage where Birdo shows up midway through, and rather than defeating her, you have to use her eggs as a floating platform to fly across a large body of water. Come to think of it, you use enemies as platforms quite a bit in this game to get past a good variety of obstacles. And of course, while not every enemy in this game makes reappearances in later Mario games, this game was where a lot of classic Mario battles would make their first appearance. Birdo and Shy Guys are the most prominent of all of them, but let us not forget that Babombs also made their debut here, as did Sniffets, who appear more sporadically throughout the series than the others mentioned above. Oh, and that soundtrack? Man, is it fun! There aren't too many tracks. I think it has just about the same amount of musical composition as the original Super Mario did, but I honestly prefer the soundtrack over the originals, if I'm honest. The overworld theme in particular just makes me bounce in my chair. It's a wonderful tune. The underground theme has a very distinct... Egyptian theme to it, which helps to set it apart from the classic underground music. And even the boss music just makes these encounters feel much more impactful and dangerous, even when the bosses themselves aren't really anything to worry about. Yes, the original castle theme is much more foreboding, but the boss music makes these encounters feel like proper encounters, compared to Bowser, who just shows up at the end of a castle and doesn't even get his own theme music. And you don't even really have to fight him, just avoid him. The final boss here even gets his own unique boss theme, which does help to make the final battle all the more climactic. It's a pity that Wart as a boss is just about as threatening as the other bosses in the game, which is to say, not very. He's definitely the hardest boss of the game, and the fact that he's only vulnerable while he's attacking you does make him a bit trickier. But learning his pattern is dead simple. He just takes longer to put down than his minions. And hey, we actually get a proper ending this time and everything with Mario and friends freeing the imprisoned citizens of Subcon, being praised as heroes as Wart's corpse is carried off to be brutalized off-screen. Rather morbid implication, but hey, he was a jerk, so we probably had it coming. And our game ends with Mario briefly waking up from the dream he's having before falling back asleep and the credits roll. Even had something I really miss seeing in these older games, and that's an enemy roll call, giving us everyone's names, and even if there are a few spelling errors here and there, like Claw Grip suffering from a small bit of English, and Birdo and Ostro's name being switched. But even then, I just like seeing this sort of thing at the end of games. So few of them seem to do stuff like this anymore, and I think it's beyond charming. There's unfortunately no real bonus to be gained after the credits roll, though. There's no extra game mode or remixed second quest or alternative world like the first two Mario Bros. games. Instead, you're just stuck on this screen until you turn off the console. Not that it's a bad thing, I rather like the music that plays while you're here. It's a great wind-down tune after the climax of the final fight. Super Mario 2 might have been viewed as a black sheep for the series for a long time, but I think hindsight has led to a lot of people, myself included, seeing it as a very worthy successor to the first game as well as something that fits surprisingly well with the rest of the series, despite the differences it had to what came before and what would come after. While the original was a good foundation, this one was just better and managed to be so without ramping up the difficulty to obscene levels. And then came the third game, and this is where everything just got amazing.
Super Mario Bros. 3 was something of a phenomenon, and for years, most folks I talked to would say it was a toss-up between this game and World, which was their favorite between the two. And I find myself constantly flip-flopping on that myself. The third game in the series, or the fourth if we're being pedantic about it, took everything that made the first game great and just expanded upon it tenfold. More levels, more power-ups, more enemies, more to see, more to do, larger levels, varied locations, secrets to find, and all wrapped up in a package that sort of embraced the fantasy and fantastical elements that made the American Mario 2 so much fun. In a decent twist on the Bowser Kidnaps the Princess formula, that's not actually the plot of this game, at least at first. Instead, Bowser has sent his army, helmed by his seven children, the Koopalings, to invade the individual worlds in the Mushroom Kingdom, causing havoc and essentially dethroning the kings that inhabit these lands. The princess sends Mario and Luigi out to stop Bowser and his minions, and will even send you letters with encouragement, hints, and rare and helpful items. From there, the first thing you'll see will be one of the game's new features, the World Map feature, which allows you to move Mario on his way from the start of each world to each of the different levels, and can even lend itself to outright skipping over certain levels or finding hidden secrets. While it won't let you get around a majority of the levels, there are plenty of places where the game will give you the opportunity to take a fork in the road, or, like here in the third world, use aspects of the world map to avoid some levels or obstacles. Every world map also has a theme and name to it that will generally help you glean what the world's aesthetic or primary gimmick will be. Giant World, for example, has levels centered around Mario being tiny compared to his enemies. Ice World has a lot of slippery ice levels. Water World features mostly levels that take place either in the water or water adjacent. Pipe World has a ton of levels that involve finding your way around mazes. Sky World mostly takes place high above the earth, so there are a lot of bottomless pits. And Desert and Grass Worlds basically act more like basic platforming worlds without any huge gimmicks. Well, Desert World at least has its unique look going for it, but it doesn't lend itself to any big gimmicks beyond that, and more heat-centered enemies that don't show up often beyond this world. Beyond the various levels, the world map also has a ton of different optional places for you to visit. There are these spade spaces where you can play a slot machine game to try and earn more extra lives. These warp pipes scattered around are basically only there to let you fast travel around some of the larger maps, but sometimes they do lead to secrets or shortcuts. Sometimes. Not often though, they're primarily used for when you get a game over, because if you've unlocked them, you can basically use them to skip huge chunks of the map at that point, since the fortress levels, which keep certain sections of the world locked, will stay destroyed even if you get a game over. Special levels are often given special icons on the map, like the sandy level in the second world that introduces you to the angry sun that hounds you through the entire level, or these piranha plant enemies on the map in the seventh world. Of course, there are also places like fortresses, basically mini-castles that always culminate in a fight against Boom Boom. Poor Boom Boom. He tries so hard, but he's so, so pathetic. Beating the fortress levels not only allow you to progress forward, but also unlocks these keyhole doors scattered around the map, which gives you the ability to access areas you couldn't before, or generally just get around the map easier. Sure, some of the ideas on display here for the map could have been expanded a bit more, but I do like them in general, rewarding you for exploration and completion, and that's just on the world map. There are also some of Bowser's followers wandering around the map too. You'll see these Hammer Brother icons walking about, and every time you finish a level, they'll shuffle their position, though they generally stay in the same general area of the map. And if you pass over one of them, you're forced into a battle with either one or two Hammer Brothers, a Boomerang Brother, a Fire Brother, or a Sledge Brother, depending on the world and location you're in. And defeating them not only removes them from the map, but also gives you an item for your inventory. And that's another massive new gameplay feature for this game, the inventory system. Throughout the game, either by beating Hammer Brothers, going to Toad Houses to open treasure chests, playing the card matching minigame that occasionally pops up, or by finding hidden secrets in certain stages, you can store items in your inventory, which you can access on the map screen with the push of a button, and can use to give Mario that power-up before going back into a level. And this inventory can store a lot of items, up to 28 at a time, and you can basically use them anytime you're on the world map, which can be really helpful if you find yourself dying a lot in certain stages. 
And this game really wants you to feel like storing items was worth it because you have a huge amount of power-ups to choose from this time around, some more situational than others. The Super Shroom, Fire Flower, and Invincibility Star all return from the first game, and work pretty much the same way here, though with the added benefit that now, if Mario has a power-up on top of his Super Mushroom, like the Fire Flower, he'll just revert to Super Mario rather than going back to normal Small Mario. At least that's how it is in the American version. The Japanese version still causes Mario to shrink regardless of the power-up he has equipped. But beyond that, what else does this game give you? Let's see, there's of course the iconic Power Leaf, allowing you to become Raccoon Mario, giving you a tail, which for some reason you can use to fly. If you can get Mario enough of a running start, you can build up a power meter, and once it's full, Mario can run really fast and jump super high and far for a limited time. And if he has the raccoon tail, then he can use it to fly up into the air. You can also tap the run button to spin around and flick his tail at enemies, which is more risky than a fireball since you have to be right next to an enemy to use it, but it can also be used to break fragile blocks in your way. And let's hope that you get used to these mechanics as the game goes on because there are one or two levels that actually require you to use these abilities to progress. But only one or two, and those levels generally give you a power leaf if you don't have one. There's also the Tanuki Suit, basically a power leaf with a full body costume attached that gives you all the benefits of a power leaf and the ability to temporarily transform into a statue, invincible to damage. It's not as useful as one would think, though. There's also the Frog Suit, which makes Mario hop like a frog for normal movement, but makes swimming much easier. It's a really situational power-up, and I generally don't use this one very often unless I really don't want to use any other power-ups. And then there's the Hammer Brothers suit. This thing is phenomenal, but a little bit impractical. It lets you throw hammers like the Hammer Brothers do, and these hammers are really powerful. They can kill even usually invincible enemies like Boos, Thwomps, and Dry Bones, and crouching down will cover Mario in a shell that will keep him safe from basic projectiles like fireballs. The only downside with this is that it's really rare to get a hold of, and when you do have it, you almost don't want to use it because all it takes is one hit and poof, it's gone. Combine that with how tough it can be to aim the hammers due to their arc, and that makes the fact that it can even kill boss and mid-boss characters in one hit a little less practical or useful than it sounds. And who could forget about the one-level wonder, the Goomba Shoe? You only have access to it in one specific level in the fifth world, it never reappears again anywhere in the game, and you lose it once you finish the level, but it can allow Mario to kill any enemy by jumping on them, and can walk across hazardous surfaces with ease. With how overpowered it is, it's easy to see why it was only used once, but it's really strange to see it crop up only once, rather than reappearing here and there throughout the world it's in. And finally, there's the P-Wing, an upgrade that not only grants you a power leaf, but also gives you a permanently full power meter for the entirety of the next level that you enter, essentially allowing you to fly through it indefinitely, though you lose that aspect of the power-up after finishing the stage. These guys are pretty rare too, mostly given to you after certain worlds in the princess's letters, so use them sparingly. But wait, there's more! In addition to all those power-ups for the levels, you also have a selection of items that can only be used on the world map, though unfortunately these aren't super useful in my opinion. There's the cloud item, which allows you to literally step over any regular level in the game without entering it, essentially letting you skip it. This doesn't work with things like Hammer Brothers though, and while you can skip fortresses, sometimes you have to beat those in order to progress through the world. There's the music box that will put all the Hammer Brothers to sleep in the world map, allowing you to bypass them until you beat a couple of levels. This sounds cool, but the item that you get from beating the Hammer Brothers are generally more useful. Unless it's another music box, damn it. Then there's the hammer, which is a pretty rare item and allows you to destroy certain rocks in the overworld, opening up paths to pipes and gambling games, and in at least one instance, opening up an entirely hidden section of the world map where you can get a warp whistle for skipping over worlds and a frog suit before hitting world 3, which is a world that is entirely focused on water. 
Oh, and there's also the Anchor, which is a stupidly rare item, so rare that I generally don't see it through most of my playthroughs, and is only really useful in keeping battleships stationary, so they don't fly off if you lose a life trying to complete them. Something that I haven't seen in years, honestly, and it isn't really that big of a deal. And geez, I've already taken up all of this time talking about the power-ups and the map system, and we haven't even talked about the actual gameplay yet. That's just how much bigger this game is compared to the others. Bigger might not always equal better, but in this instance, it definitely helps. Anyway, generally, your job in each world is to get from the start all the way to the castle at the end, where you'll inevitably be told that the king has been transformed, and you'll have to storm the flying battleship to get the magic wand back from that particular coupling. Most of the stages aren't too long, they rarely last longer than 30 seconds at least, and maybe a couple minutes at most, even in the more maze-like levels, but dang there are a lot of them, and the worlds have no consistent number of stages either. Instead, the worlds get longer as you play through them, spanning multiple screens on the world map. These levels are beautifully designed though, with many of them having tons of secrets to find. This is one of the first Mario games to really heavily reward you for exploration. Something as simple as flying up into the air might lead you to a special warp pipe or a stash of coins. Jumping in just the right place might send you up to a bonus area or net you a super rare hidden item. The game constantly rewards you for exploring and asking yourself, what if I tried this, which for an NES game is really impressive. Reaching the end of the stage also feels more like an event here because as frequently as it happens, just reaching the black cutoff point and jumping up to grab the card at the end really makes you feel like you're doing good. And it only gets better when you discover, after completing three levels and grabbing three cards, you can get a one-up just for playing the game. And if the three cards you grab all match, then you can get multiple one-ups based on the pictures you got. Two for mushrooms, three for fire flowers, and a whopping five for stars. And boy does it feel like an event when you manage to do that. While we do criticize Nintendo for sometimes relying a bit too heavily on formula when it comes to their world themes, this is where it started, and at the time, it was a fairly fresh idea. It gave the worlds a certain sense of cohesion, to have all of them follow fairly similar visual aesthetics or themes that would repeat throughout the world, or certain enemies that would show up from time to time in new or unusual places. And man, did they really up the number of enemies here. You got plenty of the usual suspects, but they added a bunch of new enemies, many of which have become classics now, as well as reinterpretations of existing enemies, like giving Goombas wings to make Paragoombas, or giving certain piranha plants the ability to spit fireballs or throw around spike balls. And of course, this is where a bunch of classic Mario enemies made their debut yet again, such as Spike, Chain Chomp, Nippers, Dry Bones, Boos, Boom Boom, and the Koopalings. The challenge in this game, I think, is just right. It ramps up at a fairly consistent pace, and the game doesn't really stop getting harder, but the increase in difficulty is incremental and gradual enough that it never really feels like the game is unfairly spiking in difficulty. There are a couple of spikes here or there, but they're mostly isolated incidents. For me, any level featuring Big Bertha, the giant fish that can easily swallow Mario whole, just makes me shudder. And those infantry and airplane levels in Bowser's World? Yeah, screw that noise. I can fly forever. But that's part of the fun of these particular levels, is that the game does give you the tools to move past them without effort if you are careful about how you utilize those tools. Even doing something as simple as equipping a fire flower before going into a Big Bertha level can trivialize a lot of the tense challenge that enemy is supposed to bring. I have to be in a particular mood to play the first two games in the series, and I never really want to play the Lost Levels. But Mario 3? I will happily drop what I'm doing to sit down and give a quick playthrough of this game at any time. It probably helps that the presentation has received a major overhaul. The game's control feels so damn good in this game. I wasn't really a fan of Mario's way to momentum in the first game, and while it was better in the second, all four characters felt a little bit on the slippy side. Mario 3 though has fine-tuned the control to near excellence, I think. Mario's jump height, his arc, his walk and run speeds, his momentum, all of it feels excellent in this game. In the first two games, I always did feel like a few times that I died, it wasn't so much my fault as the game's, though those moments were rare. 
In this game though, anytime I died, for the most part, it always felt like my fault. Maybe I wasn't patient enough, maybe I wasn't fast enough, maybe I got too trigger happy. Whatever the cause, it's a lot easier to accept when the game just feels this fine-tuned. It also helps that death in this game feels a lot less punishing here. Gone are continues or needing a code to keep from being sent back to the start of the game. Instead, you just start back at the beginning of the world you were on, and any regular levels will have to be cleared again. However, if you beat any fortress levels or any map obstacles that were cleared, they will stay cleared, meaning any shortcuts you unlocked actually have some practical use if you've gotten a game over. The odds of that happening are pretty low though, because this game is amazingly generous when it comes to extra lives. It is so easy to stockpile them in this game over the course of playing, and add in the fact that you can stockpile items for use later, and the game is much more welcoming and forgiving compared to the first two games, which are totally playable, but can feel a bit more punishing overall. And of course, the graphics and music are leaps and bounds beyond the first game, with a very varied color palette, unique looks for every world, with each level feeling incredibly distinct from one another, and enemies both new and old getting some fantastic upgrades to them. And man, the amount of music in this game has definitely exploded. Every world map screen in this game has its own tune. There are more varied tracks for different kinds of levels, some returning from older games, others being brand new, like the athletic theme that plays during levels that largely take place in the sky. Heck, the bosses even have their own themes this time around too, which is nice even if you probably won't be hearing it that often because of how quick you can beat these guys. Bye! And then at the end of the game, after beating World 7, you get that wonderful little twist, where you receive a letter not from the princess, but from Bowser, gloating that while you were running around, he kidnapped her, daring you to come and find her in the Dark World, Bowser's Kingdom. And the final world really does not screw around. All the skills and abilities that you've gained over the past seven worlds are really put to the test here, with things like surprise traps, several unavoidable levels against Bowser's armada, his army, navy, and air force. Of course, if you've been stockpiling items, then you'll probably have some things that make getting through these levels a lot easier. Once you trek through the dark world and reach Bowser's castle, several very tricky levels and very annoying maze levels, you finally confront the big man at the end of the castle, and while he's trickier than the Koopalings, it's only because you can't really fight him directly. He's still not that challenging of a boss. I actually think that Wart was tougher than this fight, and that's saying something. All you have to do is get Bowser to slam down on the floor while you're standing until he breaks through the ground and falls to his doom, the instigator of his own demise. After that, you walk through one final door, you free the princess, she gives you a heart attack, and then boom, you've just beaten Super Mario Bros. 3, an absolutely fantastic game. All of these games are great though, except for the lost levels, I legitimately don't like that one. But Mario Bros. 1, 2, and 3 are all fantastic and well worth a look if you somehow managed to avoid them up till now. Nintendo's been re-releasing them all pretty frequently ever since the Wii's digital storefront was a thing, so it's not like they're difficult to find. But even before that, there were other ways to experience these games, though not necessarily in their original form. Yeah, we're not quite done with this video yet, folks. Aren't you all happy about that? We're going to take a look at Super Mario All-Stars, the 1993 SNES compilation of all four NES Mario titles. Now, compilations nowadays aren't really that rare of a thing. One could even argue that we're spoiled for choice when it comes to them. And even back during this point in time, there would be some interesting arcade or classic game compilations released, though they weren't quite as comprehensive as what you would find nowadays. Sega, for example, is well known for constantly re-releasing their classic console games every opportunity they can get, and that started even as early as 1995 when they released the Sega 6-Pack, a Genesis cartridge containing six of their most popular titles all in one. Williams would do the same on the SNES around the same time, releasing a collection of six of their arcade classics, including games like Defender, Sinistar, and Joust. Mario All-Stars, though, can be seen as something of a progenitor for the practice. However, and even to this day, it's looked at as the pinnacle of what a compilation cart can be, mostly because it wasn't just a bunch of ROMs thrown together on a single cartridge, it was a full-blown remake and remaster of all four games, meant to bring them in line with the standards of the Super Nintendo, and boy does it show. 
Mm, that is some good nostalgia. Look at this presentation. Isn't it fantastic? All four games available right from the start. And what's this? You can actually have save features now. Yes, all four of these games give you four different save slots for them. And you can choose to save and continue or save and quit any of the games at any time just by hitting the pause button. This does come with a few quirks though. In the original and in Lost Levels, it will only save what world you're on rather than the level, meaning you have to start the world over from the beginning if you save and quit. In fact, this is true of most of the games having to start the world over. What's more, it generally doesn't save if you had any power-ups equipped. The exception being the second game, where it will save the level you were on, similar to how the original disc system worked. This is a bit of a minor issue though, as it does mean that the games overall are less punishing for players who are still learning the ins and outs of them, as they can continue close to where they left off, and the fact that you have four individual save slots for each game means you don't have to worry about siblings stepping on each other's toes. Of course, when you actually start playing the games, the biggest notable improvement is that of the graphics and sounds. Like I said, Everything has been redone with a 16-bit makeover, and damn does it look good. While the leap isn't as drastic in 2 and 3, though they are still notably looking better here, it's night and day with 1 and Lost Levels. Just look at this, it is beautiful! It's bright, it's vibrant, everything looks and feels far more distinct. You can actually see some of the details on Mario and the enemies now, and just look at those backgrounds! They all look so damn cool, especially the casual stages, which before just had these big black voids as their background. On the sound front, all of the music has been redone with synthesized instruments, and for the most part they sound good, though I won't lie, I kind of have more of a preference for the original 8-bit tracks. Not to say that these ones sound bad or anything, I wouldn't dare say that. I just think the more computerized chiptune sounds of the NES stick with me a bit more, at least in relation to the original game. Just something about the synthesized horns that open the overworld theme doesn't catch me the way the original does. Maybe that's just me, but I do still think the games sound very good. However, there are some minor nitpicks with the sound design that I have, one of the big ones being with the underground and fortress stages in the games. They add this echo effect to the sound effects in all four games when you're underground or in a fortress, which makes sense, we're in a wide open cavernous area. There would probably be some echo in real life, but here it just sounds off to me, like it's only for a split second, but it's just long enough to be noticeable and it kind of bugs me. Though that's mostly only when I'm listening for it. The sound design overall is just pretty top notch. Except for the Goomba Stomp sound in the original, they shouldn't have replaced that. Though I guess the fact that Bowser now actually has his own boss theme music uh, does make up for that. Nintendo even went out of their way to give some slight tweaks to the games as well. Nothing super major, they didn't alter the level design or anything, but just some small quality of life improvements. The controls have been tweaked and tightened up a little bit in all of the games, though it's most noticeable in one and lost levels. Mario doesn't feel nearly as heavy as he did in the original versions, and you have more control over him in mid-air as well. USA feels a little less slippy when trying to make precise movements, though Luigi is still pretty tough to play as. And you can also choose which character you're playing as every time you lose a life, rather than having to choose one at the start of the level and then deal with it from there. And if you're ever feeling in a particularly masochistic mood and want to play the Lost Levels, they made it so that after beating World 8, you automatically go on to World 9, then the lettered worlds after that, rather than having to play through the game multiple times in order to access them. I mean, I'd never choose to put myself through that game even once, but it is still nice to have the option. The entire package is still to me the pinnacle of what a re-release game collection can be. And while other collections have more games, add in optional tools like the very prevalent rewind feature found in a lot of modern compilations, and there is something to be said for presenting these games close to as originally intended, I still see All-Stars as the cream of the crop for something like this. It wasn't just a collection of ports, it took four games that were great, it took three games that were great and one game that was pretty bad, and made them feel new and fresh again. 
while giving you access to all of them at once. Nintendo even knew what they had on their hands, as back in 2010, for Mario's 25th anniversary, they released the Mario All-Stars collection on a physical disc for Wii. And it was bad. Okay, so they sold this thing with an art book and a soundtrack CD for 30 bucks. Some may say, hey, that's a great deal, but the issue was, there was nothing unique about it. The art book, from what I could tell, just came with a bunch of stuff that you could find online. The same with the soundtrack CD, though I do appreciate that it was full of songs from across the series rather than just from the original three. But the physical disc itself is literally an unaltered, emulated version of Mario All-Stars. They stuck a tiny SNES ROM on a Wii disc and then plopped it onto store shelves. The aspect ratio is still 4x3, and they even kept in the SNES controller graphic that shows you what buttons to press when you select the game. What's more insulting about this is when the game was released, Mario All-Stars, the NES versions of all the games in the compilation, Mario World, and Mario 64 were all available for purchase on the Wii Virtual Console. You could buy the digital versions of All-Stars and get the exact same experience for only $8, which is still overpriced, but it's a heck of a lot better than $30. They did reduce the price down to 20 and put it on their Nintendo Selects line later, but still, 20 bucks in 2010 is way too much for a Super Nintendo ROM. Hell, Nintendo even already released a better version of Super Mario All-Stars on the SNES itself. Back near the end of 1994 and 95 in Europe, Nintendo released an updated All-Stars cartridge that also had a copy of Super Mario World as well, which was a hell of a good deal at the time. True, the collection wasn't available in Japan, which might have something to do with why it wasn't included on this disc, but either way, and even if they had released the version with World in it, they still didn't do anything beyond just throwing an SNES ROM on a Wii disc before calling it a day. You could buy Super Mario All-Stars, Mario World, and Mario 64 on the Virtual Console, and it would be about $4 cheaper than what they asked for this. If you want to get a hold of any of these games now, well, there are a few options. While the Wii shop was shut down a while ago, the Wii U shop is still up and operational, and the games are available there individually, uh, though you aren't going to find All-Stars on there. The Switch Online service lets you play the four games for free if you get a subscription, which is only $20 a year, which personally I don't think is worth it for what they're asking, and of course they don't have All-Stars available on that service either which I would say is the definitive way to experience these games nowadays. So yeah, if you want any of these games, it's either subscribe for an online service that doesn't really offer much bang for your buck, or dust off the Wii U and buy the games there for five bucks a pop, which is just... ew. Again, you can't even get all-stars on these services, which I think is the best way to play them. So yeah, no, I'm sure there's an alternative you guys can use, and with how Nintendo is pricing their online expansion right now, the alternative is looking more and more viable by the day, especially since scalpers are driving up the prices of physical cartridge more and more as time goes on. Now, some of you are probably screaming at me, where's World or where's the Advanced series? And to that I say, have you looked at the length of this video? My voice is already shot to hell. I don't want to even think about how long this took to edit. So, look, we'll be covering all those at a later date. I got other stuff I want to talk about in the meantime. For now, though, I will say, as long as this took to put together, I really enjoyed getting a chance to play these games again and remind myself just why I fell in love with the video games in the first place before... Yeah. Well, time to fire up my own Nintendo expansion pack. I'll see you next time, everyone.